Good morning, Southgate. I thought we would start um, by reading a scripture this morning um, in Psalms 119, 105. It says, The word is, your word is a lantern to my feet and a light upon my path. I have sworn and am determined to keep your righteous judgments. I am deeply troubled. Preserve my life, O Lord, according to your word. Accept, O Lord, the willing tribute of my lips, and teach me your judgments. Your decrees are my inheritance forever. Truly, they are the joy of my heart. I have applied my heart to fulfill your statutes forever and to the end. I just think of us all in our homes right now, and I'm reminded that God is where his people are. God wants to be in your homes right now. He wants to inhabit um, the praises of his people, which is you, which is you sitting in your houses with your families. Um, And I know we feel alone sometimes during this season, for sure. It's a very isolating time. Um, But God is with us, and he will light our path, just as that scripture says. So, Lord, we just pray that you would bring peace right now. Lord, we meditate on your word. We meditate on what you say, Lord, not on the news, not on our hardships, God, on our doubts, but Lord, we meditate on what you say, that you will light our path, that you inhabit our praises today, that you are in our very midst, the King of all kings, the creator of of the earth, the creator God who knows the beginning from the end. Lord, you're with us. And so, Lord, in our praises this morning, in our songs, Lord, we focus on you. We we put our attention on what you did for us, Jesus, that you have conquered death, that you have conquered sin. And we worship you and we give you thanks this morning for that. Just why don't you in your home right now just close your eyes, lift up your hands, and just thank God that he's lighting your path. sing this morning.
We believe in the power of Jesus' name. Uh, in this season, this time, wherever you're gathered, that you call upon the name of Jesus. We're desperate for Jesus. We are a people who follow Jesus. And uh, as a church, we believe in praying. We believe in the first of all principle of offering our prayers to the Lord. And we pray these prayers in the name of Jesus. And so, just in a moment, you're going to see a slide come up with some prayer requests. And I'm asking you at home, if you would join with me as we pray for these needs. And uh, even if you pray out loud or however you do it, or if you want to stretch your hands towards the TV, and, and let's, uh, let's just take these moments and pray for a few needs. But we are so thankful for Jesus in our lives. And when we pray, we pray in the name of Jesus because we believe there's power in the name of Jesus. Let's pray, church. Heavenly Father, we thank you so much for your son, Jesus Christ, who came, who lived among us, who taught us, who showed us the way, who was the light. We thank you for Jesus. God, we thank you that he gave his life sacrificed his life that we could have life and yet he overcame the power of death he rose again and we live in that power that power that raised Christ from the dead and so t this morning as we pray we pray in the power of Jesus name and God we just pray for Keith and Diane and their granddaughter Jordan who's undergoing cesarean in a couple of weeks God we just pray for her we pray for the baby that's a little bit smaller, the care and concern that they have. We pray for a healthy cesarean with the birth of these two girls. Mm -hmm. And God, we pray for all of the nurses and the doctors who are out there in the front lines that are serving us and they're uh, meeting all of the needs. I even think of the nurses and doctors within our church and the first responders. God, we pray protection over them. We also pray for those who are working in essential services. God, would you please protect them and cover them and keep them safe and healthy. And God, we continue to pray and ask for favor with uh, First Capital, the company that owns our mall. Mm -hmm. God, we pray that you would give us favor mm -hmm. and we pray and ask that they would release us from this lease. Yes. God, I just, I thank you that you hear our prayers. We pray these in the name of Jesus. I pray for those at home that that are, are feeling anxious, I pray, God, that the peace of God mm -hmm. that passes all understanding would surround them. God, we pray for those who are sick or who those are concerned. God, we pray for the comfort of the Holy Spirit. So God, as a church, we pray together. Wherever we are, we're praying together in the name of Jesus, and we believe, God, that you hear our prayers. We ask these things in the name of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen. Amen. Hey, it's great to be with you this morning. Just want to encourage you to watch Church News. Oh, wow. It's you. Welcome to Southgate Church Online. So excited you decided to tune in. We got lots going on this week, so make sure you check out these announcements.
every Wednesday morning at 7 a.m. and Sunday night at 7.30 p.m. We've got online church prayer. Make sure you check out the church website for more information. We've got Alpha happening online, 7.30 p.m. Tuesday nights. Over 20 guests last week joined us. Not too late for you to be a part of it. Email us, info at southgatechurch.ca. Also, if you head over to this church website, we've got over 19 online life groups available for you to check out. The cross. There's a cross on the corner of 218th Avenue on our church property. Open 24-7. Make sure you visit. Wednesday nights, 7 o'clock, we got our youth online services. Make sure you email Pastor Tyler at tyler at southgatechurch.ca for more information. Southgate, we got you covered. If you need help or are able to help, make sure you fill out our online form, southgatechurch.ca. Also, we've got lots of ways for you to continue to give, and we want to thank you for your faithfulness in giving. As a church, we've been able to partner with our local food bank, as well as other churches in Langley, and have committed to making 50 freezer meals every week to families in Langley in need. We've also set up a special COVID relief fund, which is available to give online, so make sure you check that out as well. Hey, if you haven't done so, make sure you sign up for our weekly email by emailing us at office at southgatechurch.ca so you can continue to know what's going on. Have a great week. Can't wait to see you next weekend. Hi, everybody. It is a real pleasure for me to be able to speak with you today. And uh, I got to say, it's a little bit uh, nerve wracking speaking into a camera. Uh, I think about, and I know the other speakers have mentioned it, but I think about seeing all of your faces, and I actually get very inspired when I see your faces, and as I look across the congregation, and uh, I see Jesus in them, I see some of your stories, and it fills me with love, and I really do miss seeing you, and if you're visiting, I want to welcome you, and I hope there'll be a chance that I will get to see you in person and meet you when all of this stuff is over. But I hope you are staying safe. I know it's hard. It's been a long time, and we're not really meant to live alone, and it's a bit crazy. Uh, but I've got to say, I'm kind of enjoying a lot of carbs, maybe too many carbs. And I'm enjoying Slipper Sunday. Uh, I've never been able to just put my feet up on the couch and listen to a sermon. I don't think I'm going to be looking forward to seeing myself, watching myself on camera, but oh well. So let's just dive right into the Word today. I'm going to be speaking from the New Testament, and we're going to be continuing this series on brand ambassadors, where we represent the brand, or we, we actually represent Jesus as Christians. And uh, my title is <clears throat> New Rhythms of Grace. So I'm speaking from the New Testament. The Bible is divided up into Old Testament and New Testament. The Old Testament is basically before Jesus, and the New Testament starts with his lineage and birth and words of Jesus and then uh, through the epistles, through to Revelation. So I'm going to speak from two different passages in the Gospels. And the Gospels are Matthew, Mark, Luke, John. They're the first four books of the New Testament. And they basically talk about Jesus' life on earth and a lot of Jesus' words. And we're going to talk about some of those situations. So I'm going from the message translation, and I'm speaking from Luke chapter 10, starting in verse 38. And just before this, Jesus is talking to his disciples, and he's talking about that we need to love God with all our heart, mind, soul, and strength, with all our passion, with all our prayer life, with all, all our muscle, all that's in us. And then he talks about loving our neighbor as ourself, and he talks about uh, treating people kindly and showing love. And he uses an example of a man that is robbed and beaten and lying by the side of the road and many obvious people that you think would help him pass by. And uh, the one that really chooses to reach out and help him is a minority, a person that was ignored, shunned. Uh, people would go out of their way to avoid this person. And this is the one that shows kindness. He treats the person not as he's been treated, but as he wants to be treated. And it's such a beautiful example. So we're going to pick up in verse 38 of Luke chapter 10. And it says, As they continued, this is Jesus and his, and his followers, as they continued their travel, Jesus entered a village. A woman by the name of Martha welcomed him and made him feel quite at home. She had a sister, Mary, who sat before the master, hanging on every word he said. 
but Martha was pulled away by all she had to do in the kitchen. So she said, it says that she was uh, good at this. Martha, it might have been her home because she was the one that was mentioned. Uh, she was very good at gathering, at being hospitable, at opening up her home. And this was her, this was her wheelhouse, and she got this. And I'm sure she had expectation. She knew she was going to really just do it so well for Jesus. She made him feel at home. And we start feeling a little bit of, a, of tension happening, maybe even a clash of temperaments, when it says that she had a sister Mary who's sitting at Jesus' feet, hanging on every word, and Mary and Martha is pulled away by all she had to do in the kitchen. So we're starting to see something maybe happen a little different. A lot of commentaries uh, consider that Martha was probably the firstborn, the oldest, and I am a firstborn. And uh, if you are familiar with the classic book, uh, Birth Order by Tim LaHaye, he would say that most firstborns are uh, perfectionists, maybe passive-aggressive perfectionists. We're kind of finicky. We like things a certain way. And I can really relate to Martha in this respect. In fact, I have a story that comes to mind. And I was probably about 9 or 10. And uh, I got to go and stay overnight for a couple of nights with my cousin. Cousin I was very close to. Loved spending time with her. And it was the summer. And the days were hot. And the goal of our days was to find... Uh, pop cans or, or beverage cans or bottles in the, in the ditch along the side of the road. We'd spend hours so that we could get them and take them to the corner store and get them exchanged for money. And then with the money, we'd buy candy. And uh, there was uh, a sucker that was quite big. It was called a horseshoe sucker. It was shaped like a horseshoe. And I don't even think I really liked the taste of it, but it was a lot of bang for your buck. And you could uh, suck on this sucker all afternoon. So we did this for a couple of days. And as you can imagine, uh, we're not finding any more bottles because we've probably s s found anything that there is in any of the ditches. So I have this idea that we're going to have a lemonade stand. So I talked my cousin into it. And she's like, yeah, that's great. So I kind of start maybe bossing her around. And I say, you go get the supplies, get get uh, your mom to make the lemonade. I'm going to make a big, beautiful sign. I had visions of making all this money so we could get all this candy. So uh, we get all set up. Uh, trouble is we're on a really busy road. So we start yelling, and we're hoping that uh, people are going to stop just because we're yelling so much. And finally, the neighbors across the street, they come out of their house. They could hear us that well. And they walk across the street to us, and they say, we would like to buy lemonade. We're so excited. If you promise to stop yelling. And so we promised. We gave them the lemonade. And we had our little bit of cash. It probably wasn't very much. Five cents a glass or something. And uh, we couldn't yell. And so we're sitting there. And we're sitting there. And cars are whizzing by. And there's no more sales happening. And finally, my cousin says, I'm going to go in. And I look at her. And I'm like, no, you can't go in. We got we to gotta make some more money. We got to... We gotta, do it this way. And uh, she waited a little longer, and there was a little clash of temperament. And uh, she finally said, no, I'm, I'm done. I'm going in. And I got a little bit stubborn, and I wanted to do it my way. And so I stayed. And I, I stayed out there for maybe another hour or so. Uh, my pride was making me stay there. And I finally came in, and I complained to my aunt, you should get after her because I had to be out there all by myself and she went in. So uh, we, didn't, we didn't even sell any more lemonades, so it wasn't really worth it. But I just relate to Martha where I feel like she had a lot of expectation on how this was all going to go. And she was starting to get a little frustrated with her little sister. So let's go on to the next verse. It says, later, she, Martha, stepped in, interrupting him. Master, don't you care that my sister has abandoned the kitchen to me? Tell her to lend me a hand. I, I'm just amazed that Jesus is in her house with disciples. Mary is listening to every word she's saying. And Martha marches in from the kitchen. And the first thing she does is she interrupts them. She interrupts Jesus. And then she says to him, she kind of makes him feel, Jesus feel guilty and uh, is 
kind of aggravating him and says, you need to talk to my sister. And it's never good when someone's talking in third person. They're, you know, the person's right there. She doesn't say Mary. She goes, you need to talk to my sister and tell her to come and lend me a hand. I'm like, wow, really? Uh, Mar Martha was a bit, could we say, a little bit preoccupied with her needs, the way it was supposed to do go, so much so that she made it bigger than even Jesus being in her house. So here's, every time I read this scripture, it just strikes me as so funny, almost. I, it just brings a smile to my face because you just see Mary looking just lovingly into Jesus' eye and Martha marching in from the kitchen, making a big commotion, interrupting and making it all about, I don't know, we need to put the hors d'oeuvres in the oven or something like that. So the next verse, the master said, Martha, dear Martha. And I want to stop there because let's, let's get this straight. Jesus is the master. He's the one that's in charge. It really is all about him. And he says, Martha, you know how beautiful it is to hear someone say your name? And he says it twice. And he actually says, Martha, dear Martha. And I could just see Martha feeling like, I got this. He's on my side. He is going to nail my sister. And kind of her chin goes up a little bit. She folds her arms. She's just waiting to see what Jesus is going to do. Okay, so here we go. Next, next line. This is what Jesus says to Martha. You're fussing far too much and getting yourself worked up over nothing. One thing only is essential, and Mary has chosen it. I could just imagine Martha's reaction in slow-mo, just falling apart, going, no. Because Jesus had just said, you're fussing far too much. She probably just heard the word nothing, and she probably heard the word one thing, and Mary's chosen it, and that's essential. And this is what essential actually means. Absolutely necessary, extremely important. But Mary, Martha's whole identity was in what she did. It wasn't just what she did, it was who she was. And it would have felt like Jesus was saying, you're nothing. You're non-essential. I heard of a, or know of a person that very legitimately their job was cut and they were classed in the non-essential column. And she said, I, I understood it, but just knowing that I was called, my job was called non-essential, her identity kind of went with that too. And she felt kind of invisible and insignificant, even though she understood the reasoning behind her job being cut back. And I can't even begin to imagine how Martha must have felt when Jesus said these words. He didn't sugarcoat it. He didn't manipulate it. He didn't speak in half-truths. He was very direct. Jesus loved Martha. Martha loved Jesus. But Martha wanted to love Jesus her way. So in contrast, Jesus loved Mary. Mary loved Jesus. But Mary loved Jesus his way. She came and she adored him and she listened and she just remained in his presence. And I think it's a really common mistake that we do. We tend to love people the way we think that we would like to be loved. And I have another example, many examples, but uh, this happened really, really recently. It was my daughter's birthday and uh, I thought I'm going to make her a birthday cake and they had the big drive-by birthday and super great. And I know she likes strawberry shortcake. But somewhere along the line, I thought, no, I'm going to make her a fantastic vanilla cake. And it's going to be really high. It's going to be three layers and this big, heavy cake. And I'm going to put the whipped cream and the strawberries in between. And I remember even carrying it out to her, and it kind of felt kind of heavy. And uh, in all of that, I was taking pride in what I was doing. And what I forgot was, a very important part, was she likes shortcake because it's not a very sweet cake and it's very little on the cake. And she likes heavy on the cream and on the strawberries. So 
through all of it, I was kind of pushing her, like, don't you want more cake, more cake? And she finally just said, I don't really like that much cake. I want more strawberries and whipped cream. And I totally forgot how she wanted to receive her birthday cake. So this was a really critical juncture for Martha. She's hearing these words from Jesus, and what is she going to do? Is she going to just stomp away and, man, I'm not going to believe this guy. He is not the real deal and how unloving and, and how could he say such things and if he's really the Messiah, how could he talk to me this way? This was an important juncture for her. Or did she consider, did he speak her name so full of love and somewhere in that she could hear the truth and it went right to her deep heart? In this time of COVID-19, um, it's pretty hard because a lot of things have been taken away that are familiar to us. And uh, our social distancing, our extended family, we can't hug them. Uh, we have to stay two meters apart from everyone. It's pretty crazy. And even for Martha, Jesus was asking her to do something really different. It wasn't familiar. It wasn't the way she operated. It was really stepping out of what was her norm. And could she trust Jesus? Could she surrender? Even as we heard the worship team, I give you everything. And could I trust you, Jesus, that you're good and your goodness is running over me? Could I lay it out to you? Uh, the other day we had a, a really nice little distant visit with some friends outside. And uh, our one friend said, he said, I really think that this time is God is using to reorder our priorities. And I thought, yeah, that's exactly, I mean, the, in this unfamiliar time, is it a time to reset or restart or reboot or come to Mary like Mary did to Jesus and just listen and remain in his presence and adore him? Or are we passing through this world with distraction like Martha that was pulled away are we distracted by our goals and our duties and our activities and the noise of all the stuff that's going on around us? Is it drowning out? Is it blinding us to the Spirit of God? Just like Martha, Jesus was right in her house. And what she saw was what she had to do and what she had to accomplish. It drowned out the very presence of God. And I feel that God is adjusting us because he loves us so very much. So at this time that Martha was wondering and considering, I'm sure, deeply, deeply, the words that Jesus said to her, there's other words that Jesus said in the Gospel of Matthew. It's the first book in the New Testament. And I'm going to read it out of the New King James Version, Matthew 11:28. It says, Jesus said, Come to me, all you who labor and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn from me, for I am gentle and lowly in heart, and you will find rest for your souls, for my yoke is easy and my burden is light. Now, if you're wondering what a yoke is, uh, back in the days of Palestine, there would be this large, heavy piece of wood, and they would carve it out, and it would fit over uh, animals, usually oxen, which is almost like a large uh, bull that was a real work animal. And they would do a double yoke, and then two animals could be joined under this yoke. They could actually be joined together because these, these animals were work animals, and they carried big burdens, and they were pulling stuff, and plows and machinery and equipment, lumber, and, and with one animal, it was just too much to carry. But they'd yoke it to another animal, and that there would be this coming together, and there would be this joining, and then there would be the synergy of strength that they were able to carry this burden together. So that's what a yoke was. What I didn't know, and I just learned, was that these yokes were custom-fitted. They weren't one-size-fits-all, they would actually take the oxen and measure them, and then they would cut it out to fit the oxen well. And they would, they would try to make it fit just perfect, and then the oxen would come back, or they'd bring the oxen back, and they'd, they'd re 
test it again to make sure that it fit well because if it didn't fit well, it was going to chafe on them and it would bother them and they would get sores because it was ill-fitting and they would, would not be able to work well. They wanted the yoke to be custom-fitted so it fit perfectly well. So when Jesus said, uh, take my yoke upon you and learn from me, for I am gentle and lowly in heart, and you will find rest for your souls, for my yoke is easy and my burden is light. And the Greek word for easy is kreistos, kreistos. And what it actually denotes is a feeling of wellness, of comfort, of delight, of it's suitable, it's good, it's pleasant. And this is what Jesus is talking about. You come and take this yoke upon you. It is well-fitting. It is comfortable. And this was in the midst of a very religious culture. And it was a, a culture of just, oh, extensive rules and details and do it this way and this way and this way. And this religious structure put it on people. And it was a heavy burden. And they couldn't really function under it. It was almost impossible. It felt wearisome and, and tiresome. And Jesus comes in this New Testament. He comes to represent my yoke is easy and my burden is light. But he says, come to me. You come and put it on you. I'm not going to lay it on you. You come and put it on you and let me be joined to you. And the burdens that you can't carry alone, I am going to carry with you. And there's still work, there's still burdens, there's still stuff to do in this world. But without Jesus, it almost can do us in. But with this yoke that is so easy, Jesus is saying, come to me and let me walk with you and I will strengthen you. And even for Mary to consider, should I trust going to Jesus? And Jesus is saying, come, come to me, Martha. Come to me away from the normal way you do things, and I will give you rest. There's another verse that's uh, the same scripture in the message translation. says it so well. Are you tired, worn out, burned out on religion? Come to me, get away with me, and you'll recover your life. I'll show you how to take a real rest. Walk with me and work with me. Watch how I do it. Learn the unforced rhythms of grace. And I just love that. He goes, work with me. Watch how I do it. You know, when you're joined in that yoke, when you're joined with Jesus, he's right beside you. You're walking with him. He's carrying the load with you. And you go at his pace. And you don't go alone. And he puts on us love. And wow, it's great to walk with love instead of rules and do this and don't do this. And I love this phrase. It says, learn the unforced rhythms of grace. Unforced. Love is a relationship that shouldn't be forced. The Bible is a love story from beginning to end. Jesus coming to the earth is because he loved us so much. And it is a relationship that is not forced upon us. We take it. But Jesus is saying, he was saying to Martha, and he's saying to you, come. Come to me and learn this unforced forced rhythm of grace. That next word, rhythm, uh, the word actually means a new pattern, a strong, regular beat or pattern of movement or sound. And in, during this COVID-19 uh, pandemic, we've had to learn so many new rhythms. And I know that's for every one of you as our lives have been turned upside down. And I got to tell you, for about two weeks, uh, Dave and I, we were suddenly like we're moving out of the church, we're moving all our stuff to the house, and we're trying to figure out where to learn. Also, our son-in-law, he's trying to find office space and uh, in the house. And, and Dave's wandering around trying to find the most suitable office space, and I'm trying to figure out where I'm going to work. And we were out of rhythm. It, was, it wasn't quite happening, and we were grouchy. I got to say, for about two weeks, we were just grouchy. And, you know, we're having Zoom meetings, and we're sitting side by side. And honestly, things were kind of bugging me, and, you know, we were just so close to each other. I'm sure 
I was bugging Dave and suddenly I'm just noticing little noises and habits and it was not great. We were not in a great rhythm and it took us a while to land and you'll be happy to know that Dave is in the garage. People say, you put your husband in the garage. I said, no, he likes being there and he's quite uh, comfortable. He's got a little heater and space and entrance and I just moved recently from the kitchen into the dining room because I just needed more privacy and we're we're starting to learn this new rhythm. And the scripture goes on to the unforced rhythm of grace. And God's been speaking to me a lot about grace. Uh, because, you know, we, we're pretty quick to beat ourselves up. And I'm sure Martha was just feeling pretty low and beating herself up. I didn't do it right. But you know what? Jesus is well aware that we're human. He's well aware of our inadequacies, of our limitations. And he has grace for us. He has unmerited favor for us, not built on our performance, built because he loves us. And there's a scripture in 2 Corinthians chapter 12, and it says, my grace is enough. It's all you need. My strength comes into its own in your weakness. And maybe you're feeling pretty weak right now, um, all things being so unfamiliar but God has grace for you. And if I can leave you with one word at the end, it's God's grace is enough. And he is saying, come, come to me. Come to me, all of you that are weary and heavy laden, and I will give you rest. And I'm just going to pray right now and just pray along with me. Jesus, I hear your voice. I hear you speaking to my heart. And your voice says, come. And Lord, help me to trust you. Help me to come near you. Help me to know that you are a God of unconditional love. I don't have to perform for you. My identity isn't what I do. You love me no matter what. You love me so much that you want to be joined with me. You want to walk with me. You want to carry my burdens with me because you love me so very much. And so, Lord, now I come to you. I come to you. And if you could just say that in your heart right now, Lord Jesus, I come. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. I'm going to invite my husband to come up and we're going to share communion together with you. want to uh, encourage you in the scriptures church but communion is one of the sacraments that we have as a church that believers share in to remember Jesus sacrifice for us and it's also a symbol of the new covenant the new promise that Jesus made to us that anybody that believes in me should not perish but have everlasting life that is a promise a new covenant from God with us but it's because of Jesus' blood. And we share the elements of bread and wine. They're symbols of Christ's broken body and his shed blood. And communion's not a, a way or a means of salvation, but rather it's a testament of our belief and our faith in the work of Jesus Christ. And Paul writes this, and he uh, refers to some of the words that Jesus said, but he said, On the night when Jesus was betrayed, the Lord Jesus took some bread and gave thanks to God for it. Then he broke it in pieces and said, This is my body, which is given for you. Do this to remember me. In the same way, he took the cup of wine after supper, saying, This cup is the new covenant between God and his people. An agreement confirmed with my blood, do this to remember me as often as you drink it. For every time you eat this bread and drink this cup, you are announcing the Lord's death until he comes again. But Jesus said he took bread with the disciples. And uh, in your home, if you're with us and you, you've got some bread there with you, um, 
I just encourage you to participate with us. But he took the bread and he broke it. And he said, this is my body broken for you. And so we do this in remembering who Jesus is. Let me pray. Father, we thank you for the body and the life of Jesus Christ. And God, this becomes a place for us of unity all across where everybody is watching and listening as we partake in the body of Christ, as we partake in communion, we do it with a sense of unity in the spirit that we serve one Lord and one Jesus. And we thank you for his broken body because that's what he did to pay the price for us. Let's eat the bread together. And now we take the wine that represents his blood that was shed for us. He paid the ultimate sacrifice. And his blood, it cleanses us from all unrighteousness. He paid a price that we could never pay. And he did it because he loved us so very much. When John 3.16 says, For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son, that whoever believes in him will not perish, but will have eternal life. And it goes on to say, He didn't come to condemn the world, but that the world through him might be saved. That's the greatest love story ever. So we remember his shed blood that was shed for us, that he died on the cross and he not only died, but he rose again, that we would have life. Let's take this together. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. And again, we just pray for all of you in your homes and your families. Yeah. Uh, if you're alone, we just pray that the presence of God would surround you. And that yeah. in this simple act, that we have had communion together, that you would remember what Jesus Christ has done. We're going to continue to worship him, so God bless you. Goodness of 
is running after me. Your goodness is running after me. It's running after me. With my life laid down and surrender now, I give you everything. Your goodness is running after me. It's running after me. Come on, sing it. It's running after me. Your goodness is running after. It's running after me. With my life laid down, I'm surrendered now. I give you everything. Your goodness is running after. It's running after me. Goodness of God. Oh, I will sing of the goodness.